Mr. Anson Guest. It's a great pleasure to welcome my good friend and longtime colleague, Dr. Janet Porter to Columbus Rotary. I hope you had a chance to read this week's bulletin as it details Janet's distinguished career and her many contributions to the advancement of the field of public health and its management infrastructure. Well, Dr. Porter's biographical sketch provides great insight into her career in public health. It does little to highlight the transformative nature of her leadership. So let me add some details. Dr. Porter has authored over 30 articles and book chapters. She is the founding co-author of the national column, The Management Moment, for the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, and recently co-authored the book, managing the public health enterprise. And in her spare time, Janet serves as co-director of the leading quality program of the Institute for Health Improvement. She teaches in Harvard Medical School's palliative care leadership program. She advises the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on the future of public health. And Janet holds director appointments at the Hilton Head Hospital and hospice care of the Low Country in South Carolina. Finally, and among the most important of lifelong credentials, this Ohio native has been, is currently, and will always be a proud Ohio State Buckeye. We welcome Dr. Janet Porter to Columbus Rotary. Thank you, Steve. Um, I have to tell you all, I actually owe a lot to Steve Sundry. He was my master's thesis advisor at Ohio State 45 years ago. And I, because I was his only and first advisee, he unfortunately for me took his job way too seriously. I had to write and rewrite and rewrite my chapters more than all my other classmates combined. <laughs> but I got my MHA and I actually learned to write from him. So I owe my professional career to him. But more importantly, when I returned to Columbus about 12 years later to become the Chief Operating Officer at Children's Hospital, Stephen Rosie invited me to dinner, and I decided to ask along this guy named Jim O'Sullivan, who had been very attentive. It was just an attentive friend. Well, what can I say? On Friday, we were friends. We went to dinner with Stephen Rosie. We had too much champagne, and by Sunday, we were getting married, and we just celebrated our first anniversary. So I owe my personal life <laughs> to Steve also. So thank you, Steve. So um, why do you belong to Rotary? Well, you know, you would probably say paying back to the community, um, you know, the business connections you get, lots of answers. But, you know, you're also in Rotary because you're lifelong learners. And I hope to fulfill part of that desire of you today to be a lifelong learner, to help you have an epiphany about public health and health outcomes and even the pandemic actually. And we're gonna do that in just 20 minutes, so, so let's get started. Um, my own epiphany about public health came about um, after I earned my MHA at Ohio State. I worked in Chicago at an inner city Catholic hospital for a couple years and then I returned to Columbus to be an administrator at the Children's Hospital. And in my portfolio of responsibilities was the Central Ohio Poison Center. Now, the director of the Central Ohio Poison Center actually had two jobs. One job was to make sure that someone was answering the phone and providing expert advice. But the second part of his job was to do fundraising because Ohio, because the Children's Hospital didn't feel they should have to bear the full financial responsibility for a community service like the Poison Center. Well, that obviously made no sense to me. Um, and a recent Lewin study found that for every dollar spent in the nation's 56 poison, 57 poison centers in the United States, that $13.39 was saved on medical care. Imagine that you could get that return, that you spend a dollar and you get $13.39 back. And yet, even today, our nation's poison centers are funded by a patchwork of funding to keep them going, to keep those phones being answered uh, so that when your child or your dog, you know, eats fingernail polish, you have someone to call. That same study found that funding the nation's 57 poison centers would cost 43 cents per citizen. And yet there's not that funding. 
Well, when I realized the math on this, I was hooked on public health. I originally went into hospital administration because I was passionate about the patient experience and about improving health outcomes. But I ended up going to University of Minnesota to get my doctorate in public health to learn more about how to improve health outcomes and, and have healthy communities, not medical outcomes, but health outcomes. So first I need to say, I'm not really a public health expert. I know that was kind of false billing that you got from Rotary. Um, I actually consider myself more of a public health advocate. Um, at the Ohio State College of Public Health, we recently hired a new manager who, is, who had worked for a couple years at the James Cancer Center. And when I first met him, he confessed that he didn't really know anything about public health, that he actually didn't know there was a college of public health at Ohio State, and that he'd never heard anything about it. Well, he is not alone. Most Americans cannot begin to describe what public health is. Pew Research found last year that across all ages, across all socioeconomic status, across all levels of education, that the vast majority when asked what should be done to improve the health of the public, say first of all, exercising and eating right matters the most. Rather than things like access to food, access to affordable housing, vaccinations, or even reducing social isolation. Our policies reflect what we value. And we invest our resources, our media attention, our sh television shows on hospitals, on medical care, rather than on public health. When that same new manager at Ohio State asked me, you know, how he could get, learn more about public health, I tried to think of an te American television show that featured public health. And all I could come up with was the popular British show, Call the Midwife. I said, watch Call the Midwife, that will tell you what public health is about, a British show. Second, when Americans talk about health, they really mean, tend to mean medical care. Um, one of the major functions of boards is to assess corporate risks and develop mediation strategies. And I know many of you serve on boards. And yet how many of your companies and your organizations where you work identified pandemic as a top threat any time in the last 10 years when you did your corporate risk assessment? I sat on the board of AARP and was on the finance committee where we did the risk assessment and cybersecurity every year was identified as our number one risk. With 38 million members, compromising the AARP database was seen as something that we never wanted to happen. I don't recall the threat of a pandemic ever being mentioned. Now, AARP has a policy a National Policy Council, and I also sat on that, and they have a policy book, actually. And the policy book is like, it's thick, it's like 400 pages long. And one of the largest chapters in the book is the health chapter. And when we went, met for days to review and edit the policy book, we finally got to the health chapter. After everyone commented, they got to me, and my first comment was, we need to change the title of the chapter. And there was, silence and people looked at me and I said, this chapter's not about health. It's all about access to ac medical care and quality of medical care and insurance coverage. In fact, on page 67 of the chapter was the first mention of really improving health status. And in the whole book, there were really literally two paragraphs about AARP's policy around really supporting public health and health education. When Americans talk about health, they really mean health care, not health outcomes, not public health. So what is the scope of public health? Whereas there's a video about this that I love and it shows that public health is when you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth and there's clean water. And when you go about down to eat your breakfast and the foods are safe and then, you know, you you walk outside your door and the air you breathe doesn't have pollutants in it. And then the road you drive on to work is designed for safety. And then you get to your office and there's no smoking in your office and all day long. So what determines health? All of those initiatives determine your health status more than whether you have access to medical care. A lot of work has been done on research on the social determinants of health. And that's what determines how healthy you will actually be. And hundreds of studies reflect that approximately 
30% of your health status is related to your genetics. About 40% is related to your health behaviors, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. About 20% to the social and physical environment. That's everything from whether or not you have safe roads to whether or not you live in an area with high crime. And about 10% is attributed to medical care. That's right. Only 10% is attributed to medical care. Now, a lot more research is being done on the individual determinants of health. What makes a difference in that 40% that we attribute to health behavior? You would probably respond like most Americans that what most is attributed in terms of behavior is not smoking or exercising or eating right. Well, those healthy behaviors are important and they do add about four years of life to your life expectancy. But we've learned recently that that's not what makes the most difference. What makes the most difference in your health behavior, you may be surprised to learn, is social connectivity and passion. Now, social isolation is marked by having a few human contacts, whereas actually loneliness, the distressing feeling that comes between the gap of what you desire in terms of social connectivity and what you actually have, is, um, is that's loneliness. Loneliness, isolation, no reason to leave is what kills you early. A meta-analysis of 148 studies found that social connection increases your likelihood of survival annually by 50%. And in studying loneliness, you might be really surprised at the results. For example, Cigna determined last year in a study that self-reported loneliness is highest among millennials at 71% compared to 50% for boomers. So it's not the at relationship to age that you would normally expect. Now, imagine how much social isolation and, and loneliness has increased due to COVID. Epidemiological studies done years down the road may show that, that, that more people died during COVID as a result of loneliness and isolation than actually due to infection. More than obesity, more than smoking, more than being sedentary, loneliness of lack of purpose in your life shortens your lifespan. That purpose might be your dogs, it might be going to Rotary, it might be your grandchildren, it might be writing an next book chapter, but you need that in your life for, for, for it to have a long life. We would be, re I'd be remiss in this if I didn't talk a little bit about the pandemic, given that it's on the news every single day. So I have to say that news commentators and politicians and smart corporate leaders have commented repeatedly early on about what a surprise COVID has been and that they never literally thought about how to pre pre prepare their business or their organization for a pandemic. But I wanna say that pe people who've said this to me I said, well, the pandemic was not a surprise to the 500,000 people who work in the United States in public health, and probably not to even the more than 3 million volunteers who do public health work by volunteering for organizations like the Red Cross and the American Cancer Society and the American Lung Association. Also, again, public health leaders were not surprised because we learn about the pandemic as part of our education. In fact, my surprise was not that we were having a pandemic, but that so many other people kept talking about being surprised, completely unaware that a threat like this could kill millions of people, paralyze our economy, and cause global famine. The pandemic, as you've all heard, that we're going through today is most comparable to the 1918 influenza pandemic. You may be surprised to learn that the pandemic be that's known today as the Spanish flu pandemic and that you'll hear refer to that, that the origins of that virus have actually been traced to the first breakout in Haskell, Kansas. Yes, what is known as the Spanish flu pandemic started in actually Kansas in the good old US of A. So why is it called the Spanish flu? Well, because Spain was neutral during World War I, which was going on, and they had a free press and they, they published more about what was the ravages of what was happening in Spain than the other countries did. But it's not because it started in Spain. 500 million people, about one third of the world's population at the time, became infected. 
And that number of deaths worldwide is estimated to be as high as 100 million. So you could do the math early, easily. That translates into about a 20% mortality rate. About 550,000 Americans are projected to have died. That's about twice the number who've died so far in our COVID pandemic. About 6% of the world's population is estimated to have died from the Spanish flu. So you might think, well, that's a long time ago. What difference does that make? Well, for one thing, you're all here today because you had grandparents or great grandparents who actually survived the Spanish flu. We are all products of ancestors who did not get infected or who got infected and yet survived. As you've probably heard, our new great new president of Ohio State that we're so excited about, um, Dr. Christina Johnson, um, had a grandfather who played football at Ohio State. But what you might not have heard is, and then he got the Spanish flu and died. Fortunately, he managed to get married and have children before he died from the Spanish flu, or President Johnson would not be here to be the leader at Ohio State. Since the beginning of time, plagues and pandemics have ravaged humanity, often changing the course of history. For example, in the 16th century, Europeans in discovering the New World brought illness to the New World that was estimated to kill 90% of the indigenous people. But you don't have to go back that far in history. In the 18th century, there were six pandemics. In the 19th century, there were four pandemics. And in the 20th century, there were three pandemics. Well, but what about in your lifetime? Well, the Asian flu pandemic that started in 1957 claimed a million lives worldwide, 116,000 in the United States. Even more recently, of course, the AIDS pandemic is estimated to have killed 35 million people worldwide, despite spending $16 billion on vaccine development. No vaccine has been proclaimed successful 36 years later. And the United States Secretary of Health at the time proclaimed that a vaccine would be available within two years. And here we are 36 years later. More recently, the H1N1 swine flu started in 2009, killed as many as 575,000 people worldwide. You'd probably be surprised to learn that the flu vaccine that you get every year now includes a vaccine for H1N1. So you don't, you don't have to worry about the swine flu. That's what, that's what part of good news today. Um, fortunately, the most recent Ebola outbreak, which occurred from 2014 to 2016, which had a 50% mortality rate, one of the deadliest viruses we've seen, was largely contained through successful public health initiatives. And then what about Zika in 2015? So, so what's the point? The point is that the threat of deadly infectious diseases is real and it's not gonna go away even if we vaccinate everyone for COVID in the next few years. There will be other pandemics in your lifetime. Finally, I need to make a few comments on um, COVID and the vaccine and of course the results are more and more promising every day. You've probably seen today that Moderna has now announced that their vaccine is about 94% effective and um, Pfizer's had uh, over 90% effectiveness. So, so we have good news, but we do know that getting COVID vaccine will not be like getting a polio or a smallpox, smallpox vaccination. You do not develop lifelong antibodies to COVID. We know that now. First of all, it's gonna take at least two doses, 28 days apart, 30 days apart. Second research shows that humans in, co in COVID antibody, that the, in humans, the COVID antibody levels start to drop after just a few months. Around three months, you begin to see a deterioration. So revaccination is gonna be needed. Second, the distribution and vaccination of 340 Americans will take a long time, despite the admirable work already done by the warp speed team. And that's just in the United States. So don't book your long awaited cruise around the world just yet. The good news is that most experts say that both herd immunity and the promise of a vaccine that sometime in 2022 
they say that things may return to normal. But actually we know that after every pandemic, there is a new normal and we will, all, we will also have a new normal. And as I've indicated, we're not out of the pandemic woods yet. All of us probably remember that COVID outbreak in the United States really started in Kirkland, Washington, um, which is a suburb of Seattle. And Evergreen Hospital was kind of ground zero. And I've actually done consulting work there, not since COVID. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Baird, the chair of laboratory medicine and pathology at the University of Washington, best summed it up and said, when he said a couple months ago, and you may have seen the 60 Minutes show on this, it took a village to screw up, screw up our response to COVID this bad. We don't really have an approach to public health that really works well in this country. I would hope that we would learn more from this and do better next time, because there will be a next time for sure. We have 242,000 Americans who've died, and that number's rising every day and will continue to rise and may end up hitting the number of 550,000 people who died from this legendary Spanish flu pandemic. So the question before us is, are we on the precipice of an awakening, of, of a reckoning? Is this really a watershed moment for public health in the United States? Have we really developed an appreciation for why public health infrastructure is worth the investment? The strongest argument for public health is the increase we've experienced in life expectancy. A child born in the United States in 1990 was expected to live 50 years. And a child born in 2010 have a life, has a life expectancy of 80 years. Imagine adding 30 years to life expectancy in such a short time. My husband never met any of his grandparents because they were all dead by the time he was born. And that was true of so many. Yet, yes, medical care has made a difference, no doubt. But all the studies show that the biggest difference in increasing life expectancy came because of public health initiatives. It improved sanitation, vaccinations, safer work environments. Let me give you an example. Sudden infant death syndrome, the leading cause of death in the United States for babies one month to one year has decreased by 50%, not because of neonatology, but because parents were taught to place babies to sleep on their backs rather than on their stomachs. Largely due to mother, mothers against drunk drivers, now called many against drunk drivers, in 40 years, drunk driving deaths have re been reduced by 52%. Since Congress passed lead from interior, ban banning lead from interior house paints, lead blood levels in children have been reduced by 78%. And I know you are all aware that Americans who smoke, adult Americans who smoke, has been reduced since 1965 from 42% to 16%. There are so many more public health victories I could go on and on. But let's talk about the United States investment in public health compared to other developed nations. Now, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development regularly compares the performance of their 36 developed member countries. In terms of health, one outcome that we look at is infant mortality, where United States out of 33, 36 countries ranks 33rd. Another major outcome is measured is life expectancy, where the United States doesn't fare much better, ranked 28. In, the, in 2017, U, U.S. life expectancy was about 78.6 years, whereas the average, the average of all the OECD countries was 82.3 years, three and a half years longer for the average. And compared to Japan, which has the longest life expectancy, Americans live on average six years less. And actually, our performance in life expectancy is getting worse and worse. Since 1980, comparable countries' life expectancy has increased by 7.8 years, whereas the United States has only increased by 4.9 years. We are simply falling farther and farther behind. And we spend more on health care, without question, than any other nation in the planet. 
um, and more than any other OECD country. In other words, we rank dead last on return on investment. And why is that? Well, the answer is not really complicated and, and people don't really dispute it. We only spend 2.4% of our healthcare expenditures on preventive health. That's not public health, that's preventive health, checkups, vaccinations, et cetera, 2.4%. We spend less than any other country per citizen in OECD on public health. Finally, how does Ohio compare to the other states in the United States? Well, you know, I'm from Ohio, so I didn't have much perspective on this, but I first realized that public health was really not valued in Ohio when I became, I was the associate dean of the School of Public Health at University of North Carolina and Ohio State began considering developing a school of public health in the 1990s. Now they had a program in preventive medicine in the medical school, but again, in the medical school, they hadn't really had a school of public health. And I realized that the state of Ohio was the most populous state, the largest state in the United States without an accredited school of public health. We were the last of the big states to develop a school. Now, thankfully, Ohio State is celebrating the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Coolidge College of Public Health and uh, this year, but Harvard, University of North Carolina, University of Minnesota have just celebrated the 75th anniversaries of their schools. Johns Hopkins created the first School of Public Health in 1918, a full 77 years before Ohio. What we found what we organize, what we invest in, is a statement of our values. So how does Ohio compare on health status? Compared to other states in the United States in the most recent ranking, Ohio ranks 42nd in life expectancy and 49th, almost dead last, in drug-related deaths. And that goes on to many other health, uh, health statistics. Meanwhile, Ohio ranks 47th in public health expenditures, 47th out of 50, spending $53 per person per year. Also interesting to note, Ohio ranks 42nd in preventable hospitalizations. So we admit too many people to the hospital because they don't have good preventive care. There is so much opportunity to us for us to improve in Ohio and to improve outcomes with so little investment in public health. We can learn from other countries in the United States and Ohio could certainly learn from other states about effective uh, measures. Those in Rotary come from all kinds of backgrounds, business, law, not-for-profits, government, you come from diverse backgrounds. And yet, you all, regardless of where you come from, you learn about the concept of return on investment. And you use that to shape policy and investments for decades to come. When I was the chief operating officer of, of Children's Hospital, I got into a tussle with the medical staff over the fact that I testified before the Ohio legislature on behalf of expanding the prescribing rights of nurse practitioners. Terry Davis is gonna be talking a little later and he may remember this. They were opposed to expanding uh, prescribing rights for nurse practitioners and I was for it particularly thinking about rural Ohio and how much that would help their health status. And the legislation did eventually pass years later, but not at the time I testified. But I was asked at a kind of a contentious medical executive committee if I didn't think that I served the medical staff. And there was a pause and my response, which was not well received, <laughs> I have to say was, first and foremost, I serve the children and families in our service area and they deserve access to, to, through nurse practitioners to medications that will help them. As community leaders, you have a sacred responsibility to care first and foremost for Ohio citizens, to make wise decisions. And investing in public health makes sense because all our research shows that it pays off when babies are placed on their backs, when we wear seat belts, when we reduce carbon emissions, and when someone answers the phone at your local poison center. Do make this investment, not just because another pandemic will surely come and we need to be better prepared, 
do it because it has a great return on investment. Your life, the lives of your children and your grandchildren actually depend on it. That was great, Dr. Porter. Uh, we'd like to open up for some questions. I have a question. Hi, Terry. Yeah. Uh, fascinating talk. Thanks so much. And and one of the things that really struck me when you're talking about um, loneliness and the importance of loneliness and 70% of millennials, did you say? Uh, 71%. 71%. Could you expand a little bit on that and speculate why that seems unusual to me? I mean, I would not have predicted that. Well, you know, they mostly attribute it to social media and to the fact that kids are on computers all day, isolated, measuring their worth by how many people have friended them or who's watched their TikTok video. Um, it's, it's a really unfortunate consequence of computers and social media. Whereas kids before were out playing kickball um, or volleyball or you know building tree houses, they're in front of computer screens, isolated. You know, I, I, you can all remember this. I'm sure you had a moment like this. I remember years ago when, for, over the holidays, my nephew and his wife were sitting on the opposite end of the couch on their computers, not looking or talking to each other. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, we're texting each other. <laughs> I thought, what? Um, so um, it's mostly a trip. It's mostly, I mean, most researchers normally attribute it to that. And I sat on a plane recently, just an, an aside, we're not recently, not since COVID, but, and um, the person next to me was talking about how he had just sent his, um, uh, a, his grandson to, his son actually, to, um, for a year of rehabilitation. And he went to a detox camp because they wanted to detox him from social media <laughs> because he was obsessed with social media, wasn't sleeping, was isolated. And he, he had, was not allowed to have any social media for a year, discovered the great outdoors, and he said it totally changed his life. And he said, actually, it's very, that's very common in China. I had never heard of anybody, anybody. I mean, the child was like 14, 13 or 14. Um, I'd never heard anybody doing that, but he says it's quite common in China. Thank you. Dr. Porter, looks like uh, Rick Studer asked the question, what would be the top three priorities of the Columbus Health Department in an ideal world what would be the top three priorities for the Columbus Health Department? Well, first of all, we know, I, I, I'm going to talk about in terms of health outcomes. Um, I would say, n without question, number one is infant mortality. Ohio State has consistent, the state of Ohio, I don't know the statistics specifically for Columbus, but the state of Ohio has consistently ranked very poorly in infant mortality. I do have to say, Ohio State has improved in the last couple of years because of awareness and investments, but infant mortality would be one. Second of all, I would think about that because kind of social isolation is, the, is gonna be the next emphasis after we get out of COVID from um, you know, obesity. You know, we went through a whole era where it was obesity and now it's kind of, then now they're focusing on how much sleep you need and sleep. Well, you're, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see more and more focus from the Center for Disease Control on loneliness. And uh, so I would say focusing on those. And there's some interesting, innovative um, things that are happening around the world. For example, in Japan, the mailman, you can sign up to have the mailman check on your relatives when they deliver the mail. Um, and um, so it's a, it's a revenue source for the you know, mail service. And who's at your 80-year-old you know, mother's house every day? The mailman, right? Or the mail person, I guess, is the proper language. Um, and um, so there's some innovative things people are doing to stay connected. And, and there's studies in Japan where people report that elderly people say that, you know, in the terms of who they have the most contact with, it's, it is their children, but then it's the male <laughs> checking on them every day. So there's some innovative things people are doing just to have people be connected. Um, Don DePiro had a question, what can we do to help boost our immune systems, even in our older years, right now, what can we do? Well, I have to say, I'm not, I, I wanna emphasize, I'm not a doctor, I'm a public health expert. So I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Terry Davis could probably answer it better than I can. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, from 
Jasper Pearson, how can we embed public health awareness and development in our schools and education systems? Any specific policy or legislation to look at to help guide us for this? Well, you know, actually, the COVID is doing more of that than we probably could have done through anything that's mandated. I mean, people have developed such awareness of public health and simple things like hand washing and, um, you know, social distancing and wearing a mask. And so, you know, we've changed a generation through this COVID and the importance of vaccinations. You know, it's still so frustrating for us in public health that there are people who are anti-vaccination, largely based on a Scandinavian researcher whose research showed a link between, uh, alleged, a link between autism and vaccinations. And all of his research has been debunked. He's been found to be totally false. And yet it so, it so badly damaged the vaccination uh, uh, philosophy in this country. Um, so um, I, I think we really had a moment with COVID that has been better than kind of mandatory education about the importance. And I hope people will see um, promise in going into fields of public health. I have to say public health is really an amalgam. You may not be aware, but public health is really an amalgam of different disciplines. So it's biostatistics, it's epidemiology, it's maternal and child health, it's nutrition, it's health policy. So it's not one, there is a core set of courses that you're in an accredited program where about a third or a fourth of your education is common. But you know, getting a degree in biostatistics is very different to getting a degree in nutrition. And so you know, public health is an incredible team sport. And I think from other, from, I wanna say also that from other pandemics, we're gonna have lots of lessons learned and tons of research for years to come about what mattered and what made a difference. And hopefully that will interest and inspire people to pick public health as a, as a career. Your uh, district governor, Steve Heiser asked, what can a service club like Columbus Rotary do to help public health in central Ohio? Well, I think um, one of the things you can be is informed, like you're getting informed today, about the return on investment, about appreciating, I think kind of the general mentality is that we, we solved all the public health problems when we took care of sanitation, when we, you know, have cleaner air than they have in China, that, you know, I think that, that kind of people have thought that the public health era is a bygone days. Um, and so I think that what one of the major things you've done is to, I was surprised, um, Chip, to discover when I st asked Steve, I was surprised to discover that you hadn't had anyone come talk about public health or, or the pandemic during this time. I was relieved because then I didn't have to be much smarter than the person before you and worry about being redundant. But I was surprised about that. So I would, I would, I think one of the major things you can do is have more public health speakers who bring, who will educate you about different aspects of public health that may intrigue you enough on a project that you decide to pursue it as a Rotary initiative. Very good. Um, so Millie Drosty asked, uh, how has isolation increased depression in school school aged children? Um, I actually have not seen studies of that since COVID came about. Of course, there's been incredible concern and about children. And, um, you know, if you've seen all the reports of other countries working so hard to keep the schools open and not have children be socially isolated. Um, so, you know, children actually are reported to be much more compliant with mask wearing than adults are. So, the, and, and actually, I have to say, you know, in most pandemics, the, the, the death rate is what we consider U-shaped. In other words, it strikes the very young and the very old. And you would probably be surprised to know that in the 1918 pandemic, the three age groups that had the highest death rate were 20 to 24 year olds, 25 to 29 year olds, and 30 to 34 year olds. So that was called what's called W-shaped, very young, you know, people in their 20s and 30s and then the elderly. This, this um, pandemic is really just focused on the elderly and we've been blessed that COVID does not strike the very young the children to, to any large extent and that the survival rate around 20 and 30 and 40 year olds, there are, you know, of course, individual cases, but is much, much lower. Um, and, and that's actually been one of the blessings of 
this COVID virus compared to other uh, viruses that have struck us? So Millie Drosty asked, besides um, putting the children or the babies to bed on their back, what other lesson, what else can we do to lessen infant mortality? Well, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, uh, we've done a great job with um, reduction of um, deaths due to all the investment in neonatology. I mean, I don't mean to totally dismiss that. It just has not had, it's just so financially um, intensive that it doesn't have the return on investment of some simple public health initiatives. One of the things we can do is continue to reduce low birth weight babies. And the, uh, because low birth weight babies are really what, um, the rate of them is really what contributes to infant mortality. And another success story, public health success story, actually in the last you know couple years is our teenage pregnancy rate is reduced significantly because we know very young mothers also uh, have sicker babies and um, which have a higher death rate. So, um, so we, we have some success in that area, but so prenatal care, basically. Prenat good good prenatal care. care. Yep, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Bill Wehoff says, is it true that Sweden has not had the shutdowns and relied on herd immunity and that they've had less deaths, I guess as a percentage? Ask that question again. So it, it, he's asking, is it true that Sweden has not had to have the shutdowns because they've relied more on herd immunity and they've had less deaths? and Sweden, I guess, compared to the US. I can't quote the actual death rate, but Sweden did have a philosophy of the fact that they were gonna address the pandemic by um, herd immunity. And they have had, uh, I can't compare it to the United States off the top of my head, but they have had a high death rate and, and reversed that policy months into a let's get herd immunity policy. And you know, I, I just wanna say again, the good news is that between herd immunity and the vaccine, uh, the consensus among experts is that we're, we really will turn the corner in 2022. I know various politicians have been alleging we've been turning the corner now. We're not, we've not turned the corner. That it really will, but, but, but by 2022, we'll have enough people. Uh, herd immunity is 40 to 60% different estimates. And uh, between that and the fact that a lot of people will get vaccine, 2022 should look like things will kind of return more to, to normal, whatever the new normal is, which will be, for example, things like the fact that more people will work at home. All right, a couple more questions. Uh, John Stewart asked, what is your opinion of the Great Barrington Declar Declaration released by hundreds of esteemed scientists and medical practitioners, which said our approach to COVID with full lockdowns is wrong and should be focused on protecting the vulnerable while herd immunity develops in the young and healthy. So kind of more on the herd, herd immunity. Well, I, that, that uh, so let me just say what that is said because it's been misquoted. What's been misquoted is the fact that lockdowns don't work. That's not what was said. What was said is lockdowns alone do not work, right? That, that, um, that, that social distancing, that wearing masks, that hand washing, that things like that, and that lockdowns when you have peaks, like we're having right now for short periods, is one of the things in your armamentarium, that to a, one of the many, you know, in public health, we call them NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions. And so what are the, we think about what are the NPIs you can employ? And one of them for a limited time period is a lockdown. But because of what I mentioned about social isolation and how deadly that really is to people and how much it increases depression and suicide, I'm doing a um, webinar tomorrow for Hospice Care of the Low Country for the island because while we don't have a high COVID rate, we've already begun to report a high suicide rate here. And that's been true across the United States. So lockdowns are bad for us for many reasons, but not the least of which is it's not mentally healthy for us. Um, so um, it, it's not that lockdowns aren't effective, they're not effective alone, um, and they should be used for limited time periods when you really have extreme peaks. And a lot of the states are going to have probably short-term three or four-week lockdowns. The problem with a lockdown is you start locking down now, but you're still going to have a rise, rise, rise because of behavior from three weeks ago. So it takes three or four weeks, really like four weeks, to see that curve then, you know, we kept talking about flattening the curve, to see that curve flattened. So 
but one final question, and, and this is from me. I've seen a lot of different studies and predictions about people willing to take the vaccine or the first round of the vaccines come out. What is your take on that? And what, do you, what can we do from a public health initiative to try to encourage more people to get vaccinated? Um, well, I think you're going to see a lot of public education about vaccinations. There are, and I've been surprised, and many public health people have been surprised at the very low rate in repeated studies of people saying they're willing. Um, I think um, I think what's going to happen is you're going to have, you know, like anything, you're going to have early adopters who are willing to be first in line once there's FDA approval, and then you're going to have some, probably some, neg some slightly negative results because you're gonna have more people, so you're gonna have more risk where there's some you know, negative outcomes, and then you're gonna scare people a little bit more, and then you're gonna end up with the you know, movable middle deciding to get um, vaccinations, and you'll have the late adopters who will choose never to get vaccinated. Right. Um, and when you, once you've got herd immunity and you've got a vast majority of the population vaccinated, that matters less, but I just wanna say, People talk about heart COVID going away. COVID's not going to go away. The virus will always be part of us. It will be in our population circulating. And the question is whether it will, it will spread rapidly and we'll have a super spreader event. But it, it won't go away like you know H1N1, which you're vaccinated against every year, et cetera. Those viruses don't go away. They're still there lurking in the background. So do you envision us having to be continued inoculation against COVID then? Going oh, forward? absolutely. Yeah. I think we're, you know, I, we're going to get more and more studies about how soon you have to be vaccinated. The early reports are will be at least annually, and it may just become part of your annual flu. It may be like H1N1. You just right. get it when you get your flu vaccine um, if you don't have to have two doses. Right. Um, but I just, you know, you, you probably all, many of you got in the shingle shot. Shingle shots, you have to have two doses. So it may be that you go get your shingles and you get your COVID at the same time. Um, and it'll be just part of our routine. Well, great facts, great information. I appreciate you sharing. I think everybody learned a lot today, just like you predicted. And we appreciate you being on and Steve for and inviting you to, to be part of our uh, program today. Thank you. Appreciate it, everybody. Have a great week. We are adjourned. <laughs>